This is the legend of a man named Ben. Born in Hong Kong and raised in Australia, Ben was a bright man with incredible potential. With an even stronger motivation to surpass himself, Ben pursued opportunity after opportunity to build up his skill set from a young age. Finding his groove in the world of finance, Ben began that journey at the University of South Wales in Australia. His performance in school and his simultaneous performance in the workplace would attract the attention of many others. For Ben, the sky was the limit in his pursuit of new opportunities. Ben was happy. And then one day, something fascinating happened, something that would change his life forever. An opportunity arose at a prominent investment bank, Managing Director. In particular, Managing Director of Mollison Company in Australia, an international investment bank. Upon seeing this opportunity, Ben would ascend to a new level and would take on a whole world of adventures here. In 2009, Ben would set the foundation for Mollis Australia in a joint venture with Mollis & Company. And in 2014, he became Managing Director of Mollis & Company in Australia. Ben took on an opportunity beyond anyone's wildest dreams. As of the release date of this episode, Ben and the rest of the Mollis Australia team have advised on over $100 billion worth of transactions, including the American media company's CBS's purchase of 10 Network in Australia. With such an incredible career path and set of opportunities, Ben has forged a unique, spectacular path of his own. Intelligent, bold, and focused. This is the legend of Ben Wong. Sam Guo, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Amos. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Great to see you as well. So, I mean, we started talking a little bit before our recording, but I mean, like things have been great. I mean, we haven't we've spoken in so many years. I mean, I mean, things are are pretty good from uh, from over where, where I'm hearing from you where you're at. Uh, yeah, like you know, you you get to uh, you know the tyranny of distance, right? Where our family is, you know, as you may not know, we were separated a long time ago by war, I suppose. And um, but it's good to see you. That you know, I saw you last when you're a uh, you're, you're still a kid, right? So, see so you grow up. But yeah, it's um, life's good, you know. Um, I think you get a lot of perspective as you get older, and you appreciate the things you have. And you know, I've been very fortunate, um, given our backgrounds, you know, to have gr um, grown up in in Sydney in Australia and uh, be able to just work hard and actually achieve some dreams, right? Set set myself up, set the family up, do all those things. And you know, from a career point of view, uh, it has been very satisfying indeed. So. Um, yeah, no, no doubt. It's it, it's a, it's very fortunate. Nothing to complain about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last time that we uh, met uh, at all face to face was when I was just <laughs> eleven years old. So, <laughs> still trying to survive middle school at the, at the time. Uh, but uh, but man, I mean, like it, it's great that we've still kept in contact o over all these years. And I've seen a lot of you know what you've done over the years, and it's just been fascinating. And I think that's why like. You know, especially in the first season of this podcast, I wanted you to be on the podcast because I think like your story is fascinating. I think for people of all ages, not just young people, but people of all ages. Yeah. Well, hopefully I don't disappoint, but yeah, I, you know, you know, it's one of those things where um, you don't really think a lot about the story. You know what I mean? You just go on about it, keep the head down. Uh, and then others, you know, remind you that actually there's something to talk about. So, no, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, you following things, Amos. That's great. That's great. So let's go all the way back to that beginning. What inspired you to pursue finance? It's, yeah, I've been asked this when I'm starting the university careers, events and all that. Um, and the answer is actually not that glamorous when I look back. I think back to it. I think when I was around... You know, 14, 15, year nine, year 10. Um, I just liked business. Um, I liked economics. I, I liked studying business studies. But the answer actually is a little bit more simple than that when I, when, if I reflect on it. Um, one, I remember thinking, you know, we, as you know, we, I, we were pretty humble beginnings, you know. My parents were, 
you know, immigrants to the country, factory workers. And so for me, um, rightly or wrongly, financial security is really important, uh, thinking about that. Um, and business just seemed to be, and finance seemed to be where that was possible. And this is going to sound like crazy, but I remember being a kid watching all those Hong Kong television shows my parents made me watch, or made, or I quite enjoyed them now. Um, and there was always business, and you, you might be a pre, and there was always business and intrigue and, you know, Hong Kong business. And so I suppose, you know, in this weird way, you get influenced by strange things. It wasn't like my parents were in business, you know, or in finance. So I wasn't influenced that way. Um, and I, I didn't love science at school. Um, you know, like you might relate, you know, law was part of my thinking as well. So I always thought I'd do a law degree. Um, I did it in the end. And then, yeah, and then I found myself quite good at the, the, the so it does go back to high school, actually, which then naturally um, I pursued a finance degree, right, and at, at, at the University of New South Wales, and you can just go from there. I do reflect on it thinking maybe I should have been more conscious in my thinking about it. Um, and that's something I would probably reckon re re really young people like uh, you don't need to pursue or make a decision on you know your career path too early um, but it suited me well I enjoyed it um, and then doing a getting you know uh, a cadetship at uh, what was well PwC's predecessor firm uh, then really set me on that path right um, yeah no yeah it seems I mean to me, the only thing I say a finance degree a commerce degree is just so uh it does give you a lot of flexibility right? into different things you want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that cadetship was such an important first step that you pursued because, and as you mentioned, you started very early, like in high school. So having that jump from PwC right into the swing of things and balancing that that work life with also with your school life i mean that must have been really really difficult how did you manage that balance yeah it's uh you're right i think it's um it's one of the most pivotal moments i think in my life both per personally and professionally um especially for a kid like me that did grow up without knowing what that world looked like um it gave me you know like i was i just finished high school and within a few months after the summer break, went into the big town, big city, and went into a building and went up a lift, 25 floors. I remember thinking, I've never done this before, um, wearing a suit, you know, and uh, wearing my dad's suit, I remember, because just didn't afford, you know, could hardly fit, I think, but it was okay. Um, and it did change a lot of things. I think it's it's a great program uh, in that sense. And I think they still happen. I still have them. But uh but in terms of the balance, it was okay. You know, I felt, you know, you worked during the day, uh, you went to, you did your, you know, your university classes at night. Um, it was, it was, you know, difficult in that sense. But then you're 18 years old, 19 years old, right? So you make a choice. So you, there's not much else to do. There's not kids, there's no family, nothing else. So you just go to work. And I, I think I was a pretty motivated kid in that way um, to keep going and, but, you know, make sure I had fun and everything else. But, it was just enjoyable. Like you, you're there, you're in this office working with adults, you know. Um, at the time, you tried to be an adult, but really, I was a kid. I was 18. Um, and just, you know, dealing with clients and doing all these things that I used to see in those movies, right? And uh, all of a sudden, I was in an office and not getting paid a lot of money. You, you know, you went and got coffee for the team every morning. You did all those little things. And um, and university was fine. Like, you know, we, I, you know, I've never stressed too much about school in that sense. I think you just got to do the work. Um, but yeah, it was it was, it was was a really good change. I think it was really, it focused me a lot compared to just going to university, um, for me personally anyway. Yeah, and having that experience that early on helps in, in job searches as well at the time. Of course, you know, you would later go on to JP Morgan and we'll get to, to that in, in, in just a few minutes, but having that early experience especially nowadays like even if we were to create a hypothetical scenario for you to for your 18 or 19 year old self nowadays like every company every bank every organization is basically looking for people who already have experience starting out and it's so difficult especially now given how competitive it is having that kind of experience so early on especially at pwc it's such a reputable firm and a, a reputable place 
it really, really helps you be more competitive. And even outside of just searching for jobs and whatnot, it also helps you in general as a professional, as a burgeoning, as a growing uh, professional when you start in really any industry. Yeah, and look, it it's, I mean, it was, I was very fortunate to get that cadetship. Uh, I'm not sure why that, I saw look back, I don't know why they hired me. I had a two half hour interviews, I remember, and thinking, okay. I was surrounded by really smart kids. I remember that were um, that a lot of them, and I talk about that. You know, they went to the private schools, so they would have had exposure to this world, um, and I really didn't. Um, but what's important about when I reflect on it is the, and you don't have to do a cadetship to do this, I don't think. But it's what what for me was it was just it just reset my thinking. It let me develop a lot of soft skills. Um, you know how to interact with clients had interact with partners at a, an accounting firm. Um, and I felt that was really interesting, how to write, how to write and communicate properly. But then it was all the soft skills you you developed um, that, you know, you don't get out of a textbook, right? You just don't get those things. And and that is what is well, why they term it work experience. And that's what it is, right? All the technical things I find you can learn, um, but the earlier you can develop those communication skills, those soft skills, um, people skills in a professional environment that's you know there's a very big difference being a very social person at the, at a bar on a friday night and being a social person in a boardroom right i think there are they clearly cross over but i do feel that you, you need to learn that skill um and that's why it was good to learn, start that from an early age yeah very very helpful and those skills as a lawyer uh myself the written communication, the social communication, the oral communication, also really important skills to have, and especially with clients, because especially if you're advising clients, oh boy, like you, first of all, you gotta know your stuff. You must know your stuff. And second of all, you wanna communicate it to, in a way that allows your client to understand what is going on with your case, you know? So- I, 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 I tell the young guys all the time, Amos, that, um, uh, and I think about it a lot even in day to day in, my, in how I advise and how I do my job that the technical stuff actually is um, that's taken for granted. You should know the technical stuff. That's not that's not the bit that the client's looking for. That it's assumed, right? If you don't know your technical stuff, you got a bigger problem, right? Um, but you need to know your technical stuff. But then the real skill, real intelligence, and I'm not the one that you know. I've heard this a number of times, and I've really. Sort of, a real skill, the sign of real intelligence uh, is to be able to distill something that's complicated and explain it to people in a very simple way, your client, that they understand, then they can trust you to get sort the technical stuff out. Um, and that applies in law, applies in accounting, applies in investment banking, in a lot of a lot of areas, right? Um, right. And something that people need to really think about. And whenever we present to clients we always think about well if you had to distill this into the elevator pitch how are you going to distill it right right exactly well, you've got two minutes roughly elevator takes less than two minutes but you know you've got two minutes to explain something to someone how are you going to do it right um, and those skills you learn early right um yeah 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 absolutely uh and especially early on there's a lot of walls that you have to bump into the you know they're gonna, you're going to be making a couple of mistakes here and there when you're starting out when you're young, but those mistakes are what help you learn from it. I'm still learning from it because I'm very new in my own. You make mistakes personal. all the time. Exactly. You exactly. You never. You should never stop learning. That it's a cliche, but it's very true. Exactly. Exactly. And after X number of years, that experience helps, and it also gives you some perspective on where you've been for the last three, four, five X number of years as well. And that that's something that I've, I've I'm looking forward to. It's exciting. It's also scary, but also exciting at the same time for me personally. <laughs> that's the point. Should be exciting, right? Yeah. 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 So, having gone through, still in your early years, having gone through to the PWC and just having that firm grounding and taking that jump at such a young age, you mentioned motivation, but I also think there's also a lot of nurture that happened with that. And as the listeners and the viewers may have seen and heard from my introduction at the end, I spoke a bit of Chinese. I called you Sam Guo because you're actually 
my paternal cousin, and in Chinese culture, there's you know the there's there's basically the paternal cousins to simp over, to simplify it, oversimplify it is that paternal cousins are equal to siblings basically. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I want to get to that was because your father was the oldest out of five in uh, his his generation. So your father was related to my father. And from what I know from the stories that I've heard about your father, he often took up the reins as the head of the family back then when our grandfather was ill and when our grandmother passed away. And yeah. those lessons that he's learned from growing up in such a harsh environment, war-torn environment, frankly, has definitely stayed with him up until the day he passed on. What are some of the most important lessons that your father passed on to you from his life experience? Yeah, I mean, as you talk about it, um, I feel that as as I reflected on this, as you say it, it um, there was a, a lot of needs being shaped by that background. And you know, for the listeners, clearly, as you know, I mean, they they grew up, you know, our grand our grandparents, you know, left um, uh, communist China. Uh, and then set up in Vietnam, right, as refugees essentially in what was Saigon or current Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and so they grew up really poor, you know. My dad reminded me of it all the time, and I'm sure your dad as well. Um, and it was. It was hard. Um, and then, you know, as they grew up, they ran into, well, the Vietnam War then started, right, and so in the in you know, what was the 60s and 70s. So what, how do I think about it? I think um, the lessons are clearly... It's interesting. So there's a couple of things. Clearly, the, the usual stories of you know, and then you know they left Vietnam and we became refugees in Australia, and you know your your you know your dad went to Canada, right? And so and studied went to university. But for my 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 mum and dad, it was very much you know a refugee story via Hong Kong. But you know Australians a Australian immigrant refugee story. Um, the lessons of hard work we can all talk about. That's fine, and that that's pretty consistent. But interestingly. Um, when I reflect, one of the things that my dad talked to me about, which in influenced me, I think, was um, that our family actually, you know, if you go back a couple of generations, was actually very successful. Um, that we're a well-educated, sophisticated family, you know, in the south of China, and then war has taken over and impacted basically two generations, right? Um, so I think, about, I don't know whether you know, but for example, our grandfather was studying, I think, in Paris at the time of World War II. Um, you know, they were they were pursuing, you know, a lot of other things, right? Uh, and so that influenced me in the sense that as I got older, and yeah, I did the thing, do well at school, you know, go get a job. But you, there was this confidence, this inner confidence, I think, that was building from the fact that, hey, our family um, was impacted by war. There was a linear path which was going well and then things got put off course so i almost felt it as a family responsibility to um take the opportunity that i've been given and you've been given in canada in, you know in a, in a developed nation like australia and canada and and run with it right and actually work hard and build and almost rebuild what was um taken away from the family right um, so I know it sounds, you know, it's probably, it's it's not typical of how people think about it. That's how I think about it. I, I think that was one of the big influences if you look at that background. Um, yes, there was the work hard, you know, your parents are factory workers and you got to build a better life, the usual immigrant refugee story. But there was something deeper in that, um, that I feel. Um, and to your point, the thing about my dad and, and, and you know, about um, how, he ref how he took the reins, that did influence me significantly. Um, and unfortunately, I had a similar situation, right, where, you know, dad passed away also when I was in my mid-20s. And, you know, I had a younger brother and my mum, and and I felt, and I've been almost prepared by that stage to take the reins, right? I've been, you know, and 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 that's what happened, right? So um, that family, that family responsibility of being the eldest son um, is something that I've always um felt um and 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 carry right because yeah. it was constantly talked about yeah and your dad has probably told you about that yeah 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 absolutely i've I, and again like i've heard so many stories of that from my from my dad as well that sense of 
building and rebuilding and recovering what we've lost over a couple generations, I think it's not just you. Like I, I feel that too myself. And yeah. I think many families, especially those who have a very strong cultural mm -hmm. tie to their heritage, I think they have that kind of feeling as well, right? Yeah. So a good example is a former Supreme Court Justice, Rosalia Bella, here in Canada. She is of Jewish descent. Yeah. She was born in 1946 in Stuttgart, Germany, in a displacement camp. She yeah. actually never met three or four of her relatives and, and family members because they were exterminated by, by Germany. Yeah. Um, so... And plus, her father was a lawyer practicing in Germany. I want to say, but he was a he was a practicing lawyer before they were before World War II happened. So when they came to Canada, her father couldn't practice law, so she felt like she had to go into law, become a lawyer, and do what her father couldn't. And she surpassed in. To, to say it, you know, for lack of a better thing, she clearly surpassed her father. She became one of the most important Supreme Court justices in all of Canada. She's the, yeah, she's the youngest person to enter being a justice of the Superior Court. I think she was 29, and I think she was the first pregnant judge as well. Uh, so she set so many different firsts, and, well, her career, she just retired back in 2021 mandatory retirement 75 years old once you get to that point you must retire by by law so she retired and now she's chair of the harvard law school basically at this point so <laughs> so when i hear that like i i instantly think of stories like that it's like we have that kind of responsibility to rebuild for me like i also feel like you know i want to surpass myself right i want to be able to surpass my own way in myself in my own way. I'm I'm always competing against myself and see what I can do to make myself better than myself. Yeah. So, but I see that also in your career because, like, yeah, obviously, as we get to the part about J.P. Morgan, the J.P. Morgan for those in the audience who aren't aware of, it, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, investment banks in. It's the largest now. It's uh, it just swallows up other banks now. If you saw the recent. Uh... Silicon Valley bank crisis. Yeah, it, it, I think it is one of the largest banks. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's got a, a very, very rich history as well, right? It's been all the way since I think one of the the originating banks started in the 1700s, so very so. early U.S. So to see how it's grown all the way to this point, and also for you to have joined it and have stayed there for five years, like that was that that's that's fascinating because, and I wanted to get to that because. How did you get that opportunity to jump into JP Morgan? Here's the thing. It's uh, sometimes a bit of luck um, more than anything, but um, I I was at PwC um, and I always thought about investment banking. I was doing tax uh, at PwC and had a nice career path on the way. I take a little detour and traveled a bit, actually just um, a couple of years before that um, in Europe and, and worked at PwC London. but. Jane Morgan was actually, it was a, it was coincidence more than, well, serendipity really, but just through a friend um, and we met and, uh, at, 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 you know, at a dinner and they were building a new team at Jane Morgan and I happened to be in the right place at the right time, I must to be honest. I wasn't, uh, I didn't go through the graduate program um, to be to be perfectly honest and you might be disappointed in this, but, you know, my grades at university weren't, necessarily good enough right i mean they were looking for the top grades and and uh probably because i was at pwc i didn't really get probably work as hard as i should have at university um but yeah i, I joined jp morgan as uh, what you'd call a lateral hire uh, as they were happening to you know there was a new boss at jp morgan in the investment banking part of the business in australia uh and i happened to just um be recruiting a team as a young guy uh, because i happened to know you know um, a couple of the guys who were building the team so it wasn't the traditional gradual path, which is, you know, something the young guys should remember and I remind them that, you know, your path can take different uh, ways and, you know, there's not one way. And if you don't get that graduate job at JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or, you know, um, it doesn't matter, right? If you continue to work hard, um, I think networking is important. So people are aware of who you are, what you're doing. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into JP Morgan. And then uh, once I got that opportunity, 
I figured how you know how good an opportunity it was and you just run with it right yeah absolutely it's one of those it's a similar thing in law as well it's there's no set pathway to get to where you want to get to in law as well despite law being one of those more traditionalized and tradition yeah. types of, of of industries it's it's still a similar thing as well many of my colleagues have seen have seen in their own careers a similar phenomenon where they don't go the traditional route of what we call on-campus interviews which you get into big law firms and, and whatnot and many of them frankly don't want to go into big law firms so and i i totally get it because it's, it's a whole different lifestyle as well but you know different areas of success different pathways to success are what's very fascinating about any area of any profession really and just being able to achieve that you know hard work is one thing networking is a whole different it's a whole important thing too very very important at least from what i've found and i think from your case you had a lot of networking and that's what led you to jp morgan in the first place yeah and just to put yourself out there and you know but you know in a very authentic way be yourself right you know you are who you are uh, not everyone's gonna like you some will love you and that's just the way it works right um but yeah that's how i got into investment bank in jay morgan australia which you know is not a you know it's not you know it's not wall street but it's jp morgan here australia is actually a, a very very developed uh, investment banking market um so yeah i was lucky to just join the uh join the team here in a really good team of people uh that i've now since worked with for almost 20 years right so yeah 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 so back in those days explain a day in the life at jp morgan back then what was it like and what were the greatest challenges that you faced during that time um it's funny to say so i think last year i'm not i'm not in that generation of uh TikTok and all the instagram but i'm pretty sure there's this whole in wall street thing if you look it up where analysts at wall street were actually uh journaling their day on TikTok, um, the average day of an analyst, which caused a lot of a lot of issues at, uh, at, at with HR, I think, in the big banks. But look, a typical day, it, it's changed. So I think for you, but for, for me, I don't think it's changed that much, but um, a lot of it, it is long hours. Um, it is very intense. Uh, the, you know, your day typically starts at 8, 8.30, you know, like any office job. But unlike a lot of jobs, your day probably doesn't finish or wouldn't finish till around midnight at least. Um, you know, late at night, you would, you know, you'd get, you know, the work-wise, seems it's quite boring to talk about. So, you know, but it's, you know, it's financial analysis. It's building financial models. It's writing PowerPoint presentations and pitches and doing analysis of, of companies and their balance sheets, their, you know, their financial forecast, um, thinking about, you know, if you're doing a merger and acquisition M&A deal, you're looking at how to pitch the the deal to the client or, you know, whether you're in that pitching phase or you're in execution phase, as we call it, like actually putting a deal together that's been, you know, getting it to the point of, you know, uh, an announcement and getting it done. Um, but the core skill sets are essentially that, right? A lot of company research, um, go to meetings with clients and you know, when you're young you, you want to get to those meetings because you want to see what's happening in the room with your managing directors um, but yeah the day normally but you know the day is a typical office day right you get lunch but that when it gets to six seven o'clock instead of going home uh, when you're a young banker you're typically going for a run going to the gym doing something hopefully that's keeping you reasonably healthy or trying to be uh, then you get your dinner um a restaurant you know downstairs the takeaway or you well these days there's in-house meals and then you would uh keep going until until the job's done you know sometimes you'd be out by 10 o'clock sometimes you're at midnight sometimes it's 3 a.m so that that's what it's like in those early years um but like as someone said to me back then they said you know one year in investment banking is like two years almost anywhere else uh and the joke is well you've probably done the same amount of hours right so yeah yeah yeah. It, really to work there sometimes, right? yeah it's really trial by fire right v very much yeah. Tri yeah trial by fire from the long hours to the very very difficult subject matter that you're dealing with but i can certainly relate to the the ability to work these long hours and on top of that being able to work at such an intense environment but also learning at the same time you mentioned one year in investment banking is equal to two years elsewhere see that's 
that's what the experience is really helpful on top of getting a good paycheck as well. But you, you earn your stripes, so to speak, right? Completely and, it, is a, it is a complete intense uh, boot camp. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it helps because once as now you're reaping the benefits of what you went through back then at JP Morgan and all the skills you've learned there because that just comes in naturally. You're able to take it on very easily. You don't have to spend as much time doing a specific task as you did back then. I think that's also a really important lesson that you've learned and a challenge that you've overcome uh, over back in the past. And with everything you've been doing since then, it's been, it really shows. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I say just, you, you learn, you learn to genuinely multitask in a finance of other. There's a lot of harder, harder professions out there, right? Whether you're starting to be a doctor or a whole bunch of stuff, right? Engineering, but investment banking in the world of finance is a very good, um, you know, and I want to be very clear on that because it feels like, you know, investment banking gets this, uh, sometimes a good rap, sometimes a bad rap, but it is in the world of finance, investment banking is a very good training ground. Um, and if anyone thinks about moving into that, that's how you should see it. Um, that it is it is hard, but no matter what you end up doing going forward, especially in finance or business, uh, it's a good training ground because you you learn a lot of key skills, but you also learn how to really multitask and juggle a lot of things, um, which is you know something you got to learn. Yeah. And those skills you would end up bringing into your time at Molus Australia in 2009. So how did you get the opportunity to go into that? And how did you get the opportunity to set up a joint venture with Mullis & Co on Wall Street? Yeah, so um, I, again, uh, I was just very fortunate, right place, right time. And uh, so the, the team at JP Morgan, uh, led by my boss, uh, who has his own podcast actually, which I'll give a plug called What Matters. He's Andrew Pridham. He, um, but him and uh, and Chris and Julian, a couple of guys that we, we were a team at JP Morgan, an investment bank, one of the units. Um, they, you know, they discussed um, Ken Mollis at the time was setting up Australia, um, looking for a partner, looking for people in Australia to set up the Mollis. The Mollis and company business had only started in 2007, if you look at the history of it. Uh, and we basically became the Australian arm um, of the Molus franchise, I suppose, if you want the platform, uh, it's probably a better word. And I happen to be just one of the young guys in that team. I'd be, we'd been together for five years by then. Um, hopefully I'd worked hard enough and and the guys felt that, you know, I was suitable to be part of this startup. Um, it, and it was a startup. It was, you know, it was a service office. But And the joint venture came about um, with Molus because I think there was this thinking of um, we wanted to build a business uh, in Australia that extended beyond investment banking. So if you look at us now, our firm in Australia is called MA Financial Group, uh, which clearly MA, we, that was a rebranding. A, that's another whole podcast in itself, Amos, but um, that other people talk. But yeah, so that was the joint venture with Ken Mollis. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, as we started, we were the investment banking platform in Australia, uh, working with as they grew their business globally. And, and in investment banking, I think it's really important to have that global connectivity. Um, especially in Australia, your clients are typically doing things offshore. And so having, you know, partners that some people now have worked for 14, 15 years uh, and Mollus, you know, with their sector expertise, but also geographic expertise is really important. So that's why the, 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 uh, the I suppose, the alliance happened with uh, Mollus um, and I happen to be there. And so, you know, be part of that team of five guys and I just took the risk, I suppose, personally, but... Um, I've been asked, you know, oh, you know, that seemed like such a risk leaving Jay Borgman. But for me, it was as simple as um, Andrew, Chris, Julian, and Paul, who are the people that, you know, these are people that I'd worked with for a number of years and trusted, and uh, and this sounded quite exciting. Um, you know, I, was, I think I was about 30 years old at the time, and I was ready to take a risk. And it didn't feel that risky because it was with these people, who, you know, and friends and people I trusted and, I felt were really good people who had helped me so much in my career. And there we go. Just take the risk. Okay, let's go. Right. Um, and that was it. That was 2009 and didn't know how it was going to turn out. But, yeah, we, we started. No more JP Morgan branding. Uh, Molus was not a name known in Australia. Molus was a name that, you know, Ken Molus and his team was building out globally at the time as well, right? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I also wanted to ask, like, what was w- working with Ken Mullis like back then? Well, what was he like? Um, well, he's how he is today. Uh, you know, my my was, you know, I, I don't spend as much time with Ken as you know, but got to know him, and I mean, and his team. I mean, uh, I mean, he's incredibly intelligent, clearly, but um, incredibly successful. Uh, but he's he's very entrepreneurial. I, I mean, you know, the way he he set up his firm and then worked with us to set up the Australian part of the business. Um, you know, it's you know, he's a uh, He's clearly a visionary, right? And he's been able to build something very special um, globally, right? But but he left us, you know, one thing is I think he left us, you know, left left the team here to do their thing, right? Which is really important. Um, it feels like, you know, at the time, you know, it was a bit of a blur really, but, you know, he, he put the foundations in place with Andrew, Chris and Julian and, and, and the rest of the team here and, and, let, and a bit of trust and then we built the business, right? Uh, it was supportive every step of the way. Nice, nice. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how many managing directors are currently at Mollus Australia? Uh, so now we're known as MA Financial Group, but yeah, so there's a lot of business, but investment banking, there's probably uh, maybe 10, and I, I, I always lose count. But across the firm in Australia, because we have asset management, we have a bunch of other things, um, I don't know, maybe 40 to 50. A lose count. We, we continue growing. Um, and then I think globally, Molus, well, it was called Molus and Company, but they've rebranded um, the New York based investment banking firm. I think there's about 900 bankers. So, yeah, there's 150 to 200 managing directors, I think. So, it's a, yeah, it's a, an impressive franchise that, that they've built as well. Yeah, that's fascinating, especially when you're competing with guys like JP Morgan or other investment banks that have had over a hundred to 200 years of it, of rich history and starting out in 2007 with a brand new investment bag. I mean, for to have seen this incredible growth and I've done a little bit of research on Ken Mullis, like that is his background's incredible. I think yeah. one of his family members was involved with president Barack Obama's uh, team back then for some kind of administrative planning or, or whatnot. So he, he, he he's he's a legend in his own right too. So no, that, he actually is a legend. You know that. No, he, no. Yeah. Not even on the same uh same uh uh you know, same galaxy, mate, with, with guys like Ken Mullis. He's he's very inspirational and he's uh he's built a and he still works so hard, I'll tell you that one thing. And I can see it. He's still so focused on on, on building the firm and helping our clients. And that's the one thing about that we've always been very focused on, which is where we shed value, I think, with him, is we are so focused on our clients. Um, and I think a lot of firms, sometimes when they get bigger, they forget that, um, that we're here to actually help our clients and make them better. And we genuinely believe that if you do that, then you know, you'll be rewarded as well. Um, and, and I think firms should never lose sight of that and neither should their team. Because then it becomes about yourself. If it becomes, if it starts to become more and more about yourself than your clients, then I think you've got a you've got an issue. Absolutely, yes, uh, totally, totally agree. Same thing in law. Same thing Absolutely. in law. With professional it, services, exactly the same thing. Exactly, and and if anything in law, we even have a professional duty to our clients. So we always have to keep our clients first and their interest first of course with an ethical reason you don't want to be committing a yeah. crime or committing <laughs> something doing something illegal but yeah absolutely focusing on the client and keeping that within within check especially in the areas where i practice where it's very direct with the client and what they're going to i mean in law yeah especially in law they go through typically a very difficult yep. time in their life probably one of the darkest times in their life so keeping that perspective of the client is so important in, in my line of work as well and in banking as you mentioned I, I think it's the same it's the same thing and maybe it's not you know in the darkest time in a person's career it's, it's in the best time because they're growing they're reaching a new brand new exciting horizon but definitely i mean they they're paying you good money to advise them on how to go forward financially with something and oh that is a it's a thing that molus globally talk a lot about 
um, when you mention some of the big banks, one of the big things in this industry has always been conflicts of interest. Um, and in Molus and Ken Molus talks about this a lot, and we believe it here in Australia is the independent advice and um, conflict free. That is a big part of the, the Molus, and and less so in law. Um, you might have conflicts with other clients in corporate law in particular, um, but the lines are very blurred sometimes um, between you know your client's interest. Uh, and if you have other business activities your own, so it's something that needs to be very carefully managed. Um, yeah, we have a at least in the province of Ontario where, where I practice, there is a whole set of rules of professional conduct and law society act that details the parameters and the definitions of what a conflict of interest is. Yeah, so okay. it could be anything. Be it could be very simple as let's say you're in family law and there's two clients, the husband and the wife. They're both looking for you. You can only have one of them as a client. You can't have both. That's a conflict of interest. But sometimes it could be as complex as, oh, there's actually this case that you've done 15 years ago. And now it's actually someone related to them that's actually litigating against a specific client that you represent in the past. Hmm. That's when it gets pretty, pretty. Uh, I mean, I think it's probably still cut and dry there. It's probably a bad example, but like, it, it, it gets quite complicated. <laughs> So you got to think carefully about putting your clients first and who your client is, right? So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So putting that client first motive and, or I shouldn't say motive, that vision going forward. And I'm glad to hear that Ken Mollis and the rest of the people at MA Financial Group and Mollis and Co. have that kind of focus in their daily work, in their daily life, working at, at, at Mollis. So... In your daily life now as a managing director, what is a day in your life like currently right now? Um, it's so again, it's you can very, get very distracted as a in investment banking, um, but I stay very focused again on um, my clients uh, and them and then my team. I think I think a lot about um, our people, uh, the career development, um, how they feel about working at MA Financial or Molus. Um, in terms of you know where they want to go so that's a personal uh, mo motivation for me um but yeah my average day my typical day uh other than getting kids to school and everything else which is all part of the juggle in life and family but you know when i get to the office it is it is spending time with my clients you know calling them um helping them think about their strategy helping them think about you know whether it's raising capital whether they're looking at a merger or they're making an acquisition or they're being acquired um, you know, investment banking is going through a pretty tough year at the moment. Uh, volumes are down. The markets are tough. Um, and our clients want to hear from us. They want to they want to talk to their advisor. Um, and so there's that. Then there's always, you know, the, a part of the job that I really enjoy is, you know, building new relationships, um, you know, being meeting new companies, new founders. I spend a lot of time with founders. Uh, as you know, I spend a lot of time in, in, in the technology space. So... Um, I love that part of the business and learning more about their businesses. And then sometimes we're going to help. Sometimes we can help down the track, right? Um, so sometimes the joke, my kids joke that, Dad, do you just have coffee every day? Just lots of coffees. Um, and there are sometimes lots of coffees. Uh, I do like to try to spend more time at my desk, um, you know, in the office with the team. Um, but, yeah, the, you know, clearly you're not, as a manager, you're not, you know, grinding out the financial models or the PowerPoint presentation anymore, sort of not really the, the job. Um, but you need to be on top of that technically to help your team build those things out, think, set them on the right path, uh, provide some guidance, and then clearly review the final product. That's the data. But a lot of it is actually just spending time with the client, calling them, meeting them, talking to them. Um, you know, as Ken Moller says, uh, which is something I learned about, you know, you are. Uh, if you're not calling your client, someone else is. Um, and so it's competitive, right? It is investment banking is a com it's it's a very competitive environment. There are a lot of very smart, capable people out there um, competing for to win the trust and to ultimately win deals, right, with clients. Um, so that's my typical day. It's um, it's a lot of spending time talking to, and meeting with clients, and then thinking about, and then spending time with the team to actually helped them with the analysis and the thinking of the work, right? Yeah. That's an intense day. 
Very, very intense. But it's- I think that, yeah, it, it should be though, right? I think it's uh, it it is an intense job. It's not a job to you know, it's not a cruisy kind of job. I'll tell you that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And with so much that you do each and every day, it's a very fulfilling job from what I can see from your end throughout your entire career. And that's one very, very heartwarming idea and fact that I've seen from that, which leads on to what I wanted to talk about next. I'm glad you mentioned early on in our in our conversation today about there being quite a number of misconceptions about investment banking. What are the most common misconceptions? Um, well, there is this thing, I think, that it's all this glamour. We make a lot of money. Uh, that it's, you know, Wall Street, right? It's how it's, I suppose, it's uh, depicted in movies and TV shows. Um, you know, it's flash suits and fancy offices and... Um, and the truth is there are nice suits, no doubt. You know, offices are nice. Um, uh, but I think, you know, that's just how it looks. You know, there are, you know, I think we're, I think it's some, I don't think it's a misconception, but there is, you know, um, it's it's an industry that's historically been driven by very competitive people who will stop at nothing to win. And, and, and that's probably true um, to a certain extent. Um, but at the same time, it is a really hard job, right? Again, I put in the prism of finance, right? And we're not there operating in operating theatre, saving lives, or you know, um, putting ourselves in the line of you know line of fire as a as a police officer, you know, there's, and you know, or saving lives, you know. They, so I'm very conscious of that. But in the world of finance, it is a it is a difficult job. It, it it's a lot of hours. It's quite intense. Um, it's trying to win the trust of clients. Um, and, you know, you have to be quite deep on your analysis and, and thinking, strategic thinking. Um, and so it's not that glamorous, right? It's necessarily, it, there's a real grind element to it um, that I think often gets lost, right, in the misconceptions. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, like I said, it's very rewarding when, when you work with a client and you help them achieve what they want to achieve um, in what is sometimes a very significant moment in a company and also in, say, a founder's experience, a very significant, now, whether they're selling their company or doing a big capital raising, and these are significant moments in a in in, in, in a company's life. Um, and you typically get to be there uh, from the start when the idea was first generated through to the end, right? Uh, when they're successfully executed transaction. Yeah, it's similar story in law too. It's a very difficult job. Everybody that I've known who's interested in going to law says, "Is it anything like suits?" Yeah, I'm right. sitting thinking, nah, yeah. <laughs> like exactly. nah. It's not exactly. like suits. It's um, now the spectator just walks around, and does his thing, right? I get it, yeah, but it's it's yeah. There's you know, oh wait, I'm like you, I'm a fan of suits, but um. But you, I mean, you see how hard it can be as well. They're managing clients, right? But, uh, you know, whenever they get given that file and they just read it and all, oh, they, you know, someone's worked really hard to put that file together, you know? So <laughs> you yeah. never see that. It's not really good TV. So no, I, I understand. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine a very realistic law show when you have a whole stack of affidavit of documents that that is literally this thick? That's right. It's never that big for some reason. It's, it's this thin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are files where, and they be going on for only about a year and a half to two years, and we have accordion envelopes or accordion files for them, and we even need boxes for them. So, <laughs> so. My uh, technology ultimately fixes a lot of that, and we save a few trees, but yeah. Yeah. Although even then, law is one of those industries where they're still very much technologically still back in the 1990s or 1980s yeah, in some yeah. sense so they still like paper yeah. for a lot of things as well it's changed a lot now since COVID, but there's still that kind of inkling yeah. for that but yeah no it, it's very very yeah I, I think this is something similar between law and investment banking where in media it's one thing but in reality it's mostly a different thing there are some quote-unquote glamorous areas of yeah. it 
like for example we step in the court and there's a trial but that happens and at least in a lot of happens like one percent of the time yeah, so that's right. yeah that so, is exactly exactly right it's the same yeah 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 so then this next question is going to be a little bit of a hardball question it's similar along the lines of what we were talking about common misconceptions so one word that exists in investment banking tech and really a lot of other professions is the word growth mm -hmm. in recent years however there's been a new word that's been rising called sustainability yep. so especially what you've seen in 2008 and what the world has seen in 2020 and especially with the more ecological and also humanistic concerns like societal and inst instability and all these different factors happening on the international scale and on the macro scale there have been scholars such as professor nate haggins who was also a former vice president of salomon brothers and lehman brothers he was a former investment banker mm -hmm. as well scholars like him have warned of something called the human predicament or in some sense the great simplification so for some of our audience members who aren't familiar with this to briefly state and describe the human predicament it's basically the predicament that the human species as a whole faces in terms of its survival of its own survival not only because of the environment but also because of human health energy issues consumption a big one because that's basically how we live in many areas of the world social infrastructure and of particular relevance also the way in which the economy works and that's why i wanted to ask you as well in the world of investment banking because again growth is the popular word in there but in recent years sustainability has been coming on in the scene in some parts of wall street as well to what extent does investment banking address this massive human predicament that we face and how can it affect change in resolving at least a part of the human predicament i mean it's uh it's a very deep question amos but uh and i've got to admit that i think we play a very small part in that um in the sense that i personally anyway i think i think it's something that different like it's very broad to say investment bank and i think you know different people around the world it's a, it's a, like a, it's a human predicament right so it's not a industry specific thing but i think investment banking um can play right and i'm we're seeing it now right we when we advise our clients sustainability is becoming a much more important part of what we do so for example when we go to sell a company um or help help our client acquire a company there is a you know a focus now on sustainability um on esg let's use that term as it, which has become very popular but to think about it there's much more awareness now being imposed on companies and so they'll follow and if our clients are very focused on it, then investment bankers need to be focused on it um so in due diligence for for raising money or for an acquisition or or, or any of our transactions um you know sustainability has become a big part of what we need to think about not a big part i think but it's an increasingly important part of what we're doing um so you know you typically used to look at a company and say okay what are the financials do they make money what's their growth um you know what you know lots of those typical financial type measures um but now sustainability has become a big part of it um and in the broader world of investment banking you've got and why is it relevant because there's more and more capital uh that are focused on so there's ethical investing if you know for the listeners if they've spent time on that it's become a a much bigger um part of the capital pool uh some of the largest fund managers in the world have dedicated funds on sustainability on ethical investing um using things like you know the united nations sustainable development goals you know we have a fund even at ma financial that is that has that as a as, a, as part of its mandate um so it's becoming a you know and so it should be it's becoming a big part of everything we're doing how do i think about it uh day to day and what we do well when you think about it we typically help capital find a home right like you know investment funds 
find a home, whether it's an M&A transaction or doing an IPO. Um, and and if there are things that are important to the world, uh, you know, like you say, energy transition, you know, we're doing a bunch of transactions in that space, right, renewable energy, uh, and we play our little role as investment bankers, you know, putting together the investment thesis on how that should work, how to fund that investment. Well, you know, that's our little part. I don't think we're saving the world necessarily. I don't think investment bankers are, are the superheroes saving the world, but someone has to put together the investment case to attract the funding to for renewable projects, for example, right? Um, so we play our little role there, right? We, you know, there's a, there's a very high profile, um, there's a number of high profile renewable energy projects, but there's one in Australia that, uh, that is seeking to basically lay a cable between Australia and Singapore to, you know, for renewable energy. And, you know, we're recently involved in that transaction. So that's our little way, I think, of, of being part of that. Um, and I think more and more bankers, investment bankers need to be focused on the kind of clients we'll represent um, and what are they doing about the human predicament. Um, so that's that's how I think investment banking plays their role. I mean, we're, 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 when we do our jobs well and globally, um, we can move capital, right? That's what we do ultimately um, and help our clients move capital. And 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 I think there is an increasing move. Well, there is a very significant movement about ensuring that companies do the right thing by, you know, um, by the environment, um, so, you know, social justice, whole bunch of things that are very important, right? And they're our clients, and because it's important to them, it, it naturally has to become important to us. Yeah, and that's great. And, and first of all, it's great to hear that. It's uh, very, very encouraging to to know that, at least from the capital perspective and from the investment perspective, there is a great emphasis or at least a substantial emphasis on what we're facing on the issues, because I think that's what a lot of people may have had a concern about when they hear, especially here in North America and Canada and the U.S., There's there, there's been a very interesting sense of investment banking unfortunately being kind of against the curve but you know hearing that at least for i think for some of our audience members it sh should hopefully be encouraging in in that sense as well because there's that focus towards solving the pre human predicament in whatever way that that's possible it's very very good, good to hear that yeah, Second but of in that, like, if you're being really honest about it it's not i don't think investment bank is a profession is necessarily altruistic about it right right they're not they're trying yeah. to do the world but the way we make money is to service our clients and our clients, whether it's an energy company, whether it's, you know, a manufacturing business, a tech company, um, it, they have, you know, there's, they have an increasing focus in this space. So for us to service our clients and to make money, we naturally, you know, need to embrace that um, is how I think about it. I don't, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't, um, I definitely don't subscribe to it. We're doing it because we're, there's some sense of altruism here. Um, but clearly, individual people, individual firms in investment will have a view on where they want to play, you know, what part they want to play in the human predicament, as you put it. Yeah. And, and admittedly, admittedly, law is also in a similar situation as well. Because our world, our world is so complex, each area, each industry, each profession is very limited in what it can do to affect change that could lead to resolving the human predicament. Law is actually another example of that because it really depends on what your practice area is, even right. So there, are, there aren't there are practice areas like, for example, a criminal lawyer most likely is not going to be able to have that much of change or affect that much change on the human predicament because their area of work focuses more on if you're a defense defending yeah. whether or not the person de de determining whether or not the person is. Uh, innocent or if you're a crown prosecutor here in canada it's basically determining whether the person is guilty so that doesn't really have a direct impact on how the human predicament works whereas if you're an environment lawyer that's a different story where your work your practice is solely focused on figuring out what's the best environmental way of affecting change and making a more eco-friendly or a more consumption light society in that specific area or if you're a municipal lawyer well 
but you also have a direct impact because you're playing the zonings of a specific area of the town. You're literally planning out how a town or a municipality or a city is being laid out in its foundations to make it more eco-friendly, to make it more renewable energy friendly, to prepare it, to future-proof it for a lot of things. The first step is to have a conversation about it. And the second step is to do something about it in whatever way you can do. So I guess as we get to the latter parts of the interview, what's your plan for the future? Where do you see yourself five or 10 years from now? Um, you know, it's, it's always those dangerous questions. I've, I've come to realize that, um, yeah, you can ask uh, the 24 year old, or you, you know, 27, like, what's the next five years? And you can you map it out. Um, if one thing I will, I've come to appreciate is whilst I've had a, so far, you know, a pretty, uh, I've been very fortunate, um, professionally, you know, I'm, I've gone beyond whatever I, I could have imagined, not beyond, but, you know, in terms of it was just a, from humble beginnings. Um, I get to work with some great people. I've worked with this, you know, a, a team that I've been together 20s, which is very lucky. But to answer your question, you think about these things in my stage of my career in life, but uh, I'm actually pretty excited for the future, you know. You know, personally, got a beautiful family. Uh, professionally, I work in a, you know, and be part of this wonderful firm with some great people that that is growing. And I think we do do the right things as a firm, which, you know, you know going back to the human predicament, I think we are uh, we are what we are. We're a financial company, financial services company, but, you know, I think we have a really strong character. But um, so what does that mean? I think the next five, 10 years, I think I'd like to continue to work on our clients and do my thing. Um, but actually spend a lot of time developing, um, you know, the next generation. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talent in the next generation, you know, people in your age group who will take the mantle and run with it um, in the firm. Um, but, you know, it's funny, life is, uh, I think a lot of people assume life is, the assumption is linear. Um, I just don't think it is, right? So what is exciting about the next five, 10 years is actually what can come up. Uh, the the different challenges, but also opportunities. Um, I like to see the firm continue to grow professionally, and then clearly spend a lot of time with family. And it's a it's a real big focus. And I think it's it's something that you know I think a lot of people try to get that balance right between you know the professional and and the personal. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, the from a from investment from a, the financial markets are, are very volatile at the moment. Um, but I'm uh, I'm generally quite an optimistic person, I suppose, and half glass full. Uh, it feels like you know the interest rates have risen a lot, and so I think there's going to be opportunities now for the next stage of of, of growth in the financial markets and for companies. Um, now, whether they do that sustainably or not, well, that is the you know going to early topic. That is a key focus. But I like uh, I like I'm very fortunate to be able to play a part in that. I think and, and continue to do that, but. The, the thing I think about is, I don't know. I mean, in a way, I don't know what the next five, 10 years brings, right? Um, there's a path that I think is going to happen. Keep doing my job, keep you know, raising the family and, you know, spend time with friends and do lots of things that you get to my stage of career and life that I like to do. But, um, but you don't know, you know, it's not linear, right? Things pop up, you know. When I was at JP Morgan, you know, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that I was going to have the opportunity to be part of this this team that set up what well, was Moldus in Australia, right? Um, and that put me on a you know slightly different path, right? So that's the exciting part about life. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking about building up the next generation of investment bankers and professionals, what's your advice to those who are considering a pathway into finance? Um, a couple of things. I mean, like, there's the, the there's a the real practical advice. Um, I think have an open mind to what is finance. Investment banking is, like I said earlier, is a great training ground. Um, I think if you want to do it, then you need to show and have a genuine interest in financial markets and companies. So, for example, you know, you you should, you know, I said you should be reading a daily habit. Should be reading the financial press, um, you know, wherever it is, like the Wall Street Journal or uh, the Australian Financial Review here, or you know, there's 
you know, read The Economist, you know, you, which is a bit broader, but, you know, show a real interest in that. Um, I think start investing, I think is a real skill that people should have. So, you know, even if you don't have a lot of money and a lot of savings, you should start investing in the stock market um, because it should force you to learn about what drives value in a company, which is ultimately very important what we do. Um, and then on the softer skill side, I think the networking piece is really important. Know that um, you don't have to, you know, necessarily be the most extroverted person either. Um, but you definitely want to meet people because you learn a lot more about companies, about their strategy by talking to people rather than reading things, you know, you know, in an annual report. Um, so that's a really important skill to to teach yourself, and it comes natural to some and uh, less natural for others. But it's still something that you know, if you want to think about a career in investment banking, it's it's an important skill set. And that's not just with clients, but it's also internally managing you know, people and getting to know people and networking. I think that's an important part of it. That's how, that's how I think about it. Everything else you're going to learn, right? How to build a financial model, how to write a PowerPoint presentation, how to, you know, that you can learn. But showing a genuine interest in the financial markets is something that you either have or you need to develop um, is a big part of how I think about it because it gives you the bigger picture, I think. It certainly does with the bigger picture and also with – networking as we mentioned it's such an important part and as we've seen in your career ben it's been one amazing ride it's been an amazing few decades you're still going you're still, still going, building man. still young I'm, I'm <laughs> i still feel like I'm, sometimes i feel like i'm just getting started so yeah 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 so still many many years and decades of exciting new ventures and new adventures as well yeah. for you and I mean, it's it's going to be very exciting. And for that matter, thank you so very, very much for coming on to the show uh, today. And it's been also great ca catching up with you after so many years. And yeah, if, if you're in Canada next time, just l let me know. I mean, you know, de definitely be down to, to catch up uh, even further, you know, over over a meal or, or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we'll be in that part of the world. It, it's, it's on our list to go there. Uh... Uh, my son's a Toronto Raptors fan, so we'll be going to one of those games soon. Yay, we the North. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, what... definitely, it's been good seeing you, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll, now that now that you're all grown up, it's much easier to get together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and once again, yeah, looking forward to catching up. Thank you so much, and and thank you to our audience as well for tuning into this episode of This Is the Legend of. You have just heard the real life legendary story of Ben Wong, managing director at Molus Australia, now M A Financial Group. You can check out more of our episodes and more of our content also on our website and on our social media we'll have links in the description and once again thank you so much for tuning in tune in next time signing off for now this is amos vang stay safe stay healthy and stay legendary mm -hmm.